How's it going? <laughs> wow, you really can't see anything up here. I'm a poet I'm used to reading at universities, where it's just like, feels like a sort of beat up bookstore. Kind of feel, so this is very theater. Um, I'm, uh, I wanted to tell a little bit of the story I was going to tell to talk about um, uh, the story I'm actually going to tell. And so uh, I thought of two people um, when I got the theme, the one that got away. And uh, the first is kind of funny, and, and the second one isn't. Uh, so the first one I'm gonna, is going to be abbreviated, because it's a story I'm not really going to tell. I'm just going to do a poem about it, and then I'm going to tell the story. So uh, this is about my middle school boyfriend. It's called It Has Always Been Frankie Casanelli. <laughs> baseball jacket that fit me like pantyhose for the upper body, which could make me into a kind of mass speed if you think about it, and I could run around while gas stations in my Frankie Casanelli mask, which is really a jacket, but fits like a mask. And then he dumps me, and my mother says, there are other fish in the sea, when really she means you'll spend years trying to drown yourself just like I do over men who I've never loved. Except for that moment, when you put his tiny man jacket on your big woman belly and your friends say, Frankie likes you, which to you means the world is your oyster, but then you remember you hate oysters and pearls and there must be something else to find in this sea, like Frankie Casanelli's cousin, Anthony, who is allergic to bee stings and wears the same Metallica t-shirt every day because his parents are never home in the dark, quiet mornings in which being 14 is enough sin all of us. <laughs> the truth is, I didn't love Frankie or Anthony, but they were ways of defining the teenage self with shiny gold bait plates on hit it up next that meant I belonged to someone else and therefore was not responsible for my actions, which a good fraction of the time were not nice. <laughs> I was a not nice teenager. The kind of girl who'd call you out in the courtyard if you looked at her wrong. The kind of girl who wore black stretch jeans and black concert t-shirts. So you'd know she was a literal piece of night sky. The kind of girl who didn't blow her runny nose, but just kind of sniffed all day long. <laughs> Other girls wanted to be me, to have that kind of night sky power, but I was Frankie Casanelli's girl, and the day he left me for Jennifer Seaman, which I find funny both in the sperm sense and in the sailor at sea sense, <laughs> I cried tears that from this night sky body were really sucks. Uh, so, <laughs> She was banging on the bathroom door going like, come on, just come out of the bathroom. And I was like, you don't understand, I love to. <laughs> <laughs> so he's one that got away. <laughs> the second thing I thought of isn't as funny, and uh, I thought about just forgetting about that and just telling that story in a longer version. But then I was like, no, uh, you should learn something from this experience too. So this is a story I really uh, I have a poem sort of about it that I don't usually read out loud, and uh, it's a story that later I've told maybe 10 people in my whole life. So, um, so this is about another, another, another guy that got away. Um, in 2001, I was driving from Buckdale University, which is a small college in central Pennsylvania, to the University of Pittsburgh, uh, where I was getting a graduate degree. So I went back to where I went to college to visit some friends. And uh, it, this is a part of Pennsylvania that basically wants you leave this small town in central Pennsylvania. It's a lot of uh, country road. It was a beautiful drive, a really beautiful drive. Uh, about four hours. So about two hours in, it's like, oh man, I have to go to the bathroom, which um, for people who are as queer looking as me, having to go uh, to the bathroom uh, at a rest stop is stressful. Um, but I was like, okay, well, gotta do it, man. I'm not gonna side of the road it. Like, let's just, let's just go, we can do it. So I get to this gas station, and when I get inside the gas station, I'm waiting in line to pay for my gas, and I'm looking out, and it's just gorgeous out. There's just mountains and these country roads, and this woman is standing in line in front of me, and she's like, gosh, you know, that is such a beautiful sunset. And I was like, yeah, you know, it really is. It's gorgeous. And I got to the front, just a 
only a little bit of awkwardness when I was like, hey, key to the bathroom, and the guy looks at me like, <laughs> and I'm weird, and I'm like, just show me the keys, I'll just take the one I want, and like, that's how it goes. Hang on. So anyway, I, I take the key to the women's room, which I use some of the time. Uh, I was relieved, because when I went around back to the back of the gas station and stuck the key in, it was just a single room. So I was like, safe. You know, I just pee, back in the car. I got the key, no one's coming in here. I got the key, you know? So I was feeling relaxed now, I was feeling good. I was getting back on the road and um, did my business. You know, I don't need to hear that part of the story. <laughs> when I walked out of the bathroom out of nowhere, came a guy that seemed like he was a giant uh, who grabbed me and put his forearm into my throat. And uh, I was just like, what? What's even happening? And I thought, am I getting robbed? Like, what is going on? And uh, he said, men don't like it when freak little man dykes talk to their girlfriends. And I was, still couldn't even remember at this point having talked to anyone. So uh, at this point, I started thinking about my mom, you know? I started thinking like, my mom's gonna have to like, she's gonna have to like put a little vigil at school, you know? Like, this is the kind of shit my mom is afraid of right here, this is it. And not really out of fear of dying, but out of thinking about my mom, I, I started to cry. Tears started coming down my face. And uh, I watched this guy's face just sort of change. And he sort of let go and stepped back. And I was just like, okay, he's gonna let go. But I was like too scared to run, so I was just kind of just standing there. And he said, <clears throat> and I, I'll actually never forget this part more. He said, uh, that's right, you cry, because that's what women do. And of course, I was filled with so many things at that moment, but again, I didn't move. I didn't do anything. I just stood there until he backed away. Once he backed away, I went back to my little, little Hyundai. And I remember getting in the car and just, I don't know how many minutes went by, but I just, just sat in the seat of the car. I, you would think that, I don't know, I'd peel out of there or something, but I just, I just sat in the car. And then I thought, what are you doing? Call the police. He's got assault him. Call the police. And then I was like, you can't call the police. You don't know where you are. I mean, the cop that shows up could hate queer people more than that guy did. Like, what are you doing? Get the hell out of here. You know? So I started the car and I started to drive. And the part of the story that sort of gets me most, so I mean, obviously, he should have gotten away, and I hope that there's some point where that guy and someone has to come to terms with himself, but I was driving back to Pittsburgh, and uh, I started thinking about this poet I knew in college. His name was Jeremy Finkelman. He's, I, didn't, I don't think he ever like published a ton of stuff or anything. But I remember reading this poem that he wrote in class. The poem's called Men Shake Hands. It was about this moment when he had been, his father traveled a lot for business and his mom always taking him to the airport to drop him off. And it was about this moment when he was about five or six where he went to hug his dad and his dad sort of shoved him back and he said, hey, no more hugging, men shake hands. Um, and I remember him reading that poem out loud in the class and I remember that like bubbling up a feeling I started thinking when I was driving back, you know, what happened to that guy? You know, what happens to all of us? Like when all these possibilities get foreclosed. Like, and I started thinking about the times that, you know, my mom sat me down and said like, listen, it was cool for you to swim with your brother and send your Wonder Woman uh, underwear with no shirt on before, but now it's not cool anymore. Or, okay, it's really cool to play baseball and when we made, made the travel team, but now you have to play softball because we don't know where you're gonna change. And, you know, like all these moments, all these losses, all these griefs that people experience basically because of gender. And I travel all over the country actually and talk about this stuff and people want to tell me their like gender grief stories all the time. Like when I'm done talking, people who are very conventionally gender looking folks will come up to me and say like, this is what happened to me, like when something got taken from me. You know, and so there's this way that I, I feel like, um, 
there's like so many ones that get away um, when we sort of don't let people experience the full possibility of, of who they are. So I've gotten to a point where I guess I, I wish that for that guy, um, that really, really sad guy. And I'm sorry that I also brought everyone down now. I do not have anything else <laughs> fun to say. <laughs> um, so that's, that's my story, and I appreciate uh, y'all listening. So thanks.